So thank you very much, and thank you, Rakesh, for having us. So let me start. We're talking about innovation, new technologies, but let me start with something very old, which is Greek mythology. So our company is named Kairos. It's named after the Greek god of opportunity. And uh, I don't know if you know his story, but he, say, uh, he has two very distinct features. So the first one is that obviously is opportunity and is moving and running around and it's very difficult to get hold of him. The second feature is that he's got a sort of a tuft of hair coming off his forehead. So basically you can only get him when he comes at you. So when he's gone, he's gone forever. We see today at Kairos that there's a great opportunity to disrupt the energy markets thanks to the advent of new technologies in machine learning, but also new data available. Um, now, you've heard uh, probably often even too much over the last years, there's a bit of buzz about um, artificial intelligence and big data, new data, and how it's affecting mostly financial markets. It is something that we have seen because it started probably mostly in the back office. You see a lot of processes being automated. Now there's more about money laundering, compliance, etc. But over the last two years, it has really moved to the front desk. And you have more and more automated trading, more and more decisions on the asset manager, hedge funds, taken by intelligent, semi-automated algorithm. Now, in spite of all these technology advances, there is still a huge market that has not been touched by this uh, innovation. So, and this is the energy market. So if you look at it, let's take the example of the oil and gas. The oil and gas sector is huge. So really, the, the oil and gas markets are really, really big. We're talking trillion dollars, whatever you look at it, in the capex of the industry, the market cap of the companies in the oil and gas sector, but also the volumes traded every day, both physical in terms of barrels, but also contracts and futures. Historically, there has been a huge disconnect in between such a big and important sector, depending on how you slice and dice it, can be in between 15 to 20 percent of the world GDP, and actually is the basis of our civilization, and the information available for that sector. So oil and gas, specifically supply, when you look at production, demand, storage. Uh, it's a sector that has been sort of cartelized. Uh, we all know the geopolitics of oil and gas. So often by design, information has not been flowing. Plus, most of the installations are remote things. The action is happening really far away from where we can see it. And the way it has been traded and the, the financial information about it often is treated a bit. It's kind of an old boys club and things happen always uh, sometimes behind the scenes. Now, this has led to very, very poor uh, decisions on the capital allocation, decisions on investments, but more often you, the proof of that is that you see the two big trends of the last 10 years has been completely lost or missed by all the analysts. So one is the advent of U.S. shale. Nobody saw it coming. Nobody could understand the implications. The second one is the huge slump in volatility in prices over the last five years. So again, there is something to be done here, and we think that this is the right moment now to do it. Why is the right moment to do it? Well, basically, because you have new technologies and you have new data. Let me start from the data. So as of today, you have, as you see in the slide, you have many, many new uh, sources of information that five, ten years ago were just not there. So let's take the satellite industry before we had to rely on constellations by, that were actually launched and managed by governments. Today, you have basically every quarter, you have a new private constellation of microsatellites coming online making images commercially available. And this is really valuable because you can actually use that to track and detect changes, but also to track activity of uh, several different industries. Then you have everything that is actually, as the two Simons were telling before, all the information of the Internet of Things, so sensor-related information. You have more and more devices that transmit information. But you also have the information that you generate yourself. It's called user-generated data because your mobile phone, all the things that you carry with you, they emit data like, for instance, uh, positioning, metadata, images, etc. You have the GPSs, but above all, you have this a bit of a push for an open society. So more and more countries, more and more companies are actually disclosing data about their operations, about their technical attributes, etc. So that really creates a huge, huge data pool that is ready to be used. And this is where the technology comes into play. Comes into play because thanks to machine learning, we can today mix 
very, very diverse sources of data. You can take satellite images, you can mix it with text, you can mix it with analytical data, and actually you can mix it and create new data based on that. This is really a game changer. The second important thing is the infrastructure. So actually a company like us, probably five years ago, we couldn't do what we do today because thanks to the cloud computing and cloud storage, the capex actually of obtaining and managing data has gone drastically down. So today you basically, you call your provider and you can get more computing power. Now the mix of the two actually is creating a really good scenario and why we do that? Because that enables us at Kairos to basically we track the physical flows for the energy and oil and gas industry globally. What that means is that basically we now have eyes on, oops, on areas or zones or sectors for which there was no information available before. You can take the supply side, so basically today we can provide information and analysis on what's produced across different areas of the world, but also the storage, the transportation of the volumes produced, and finally also how it is consumed at the very end. So basically we follow the hydrocarbon on the molecule from the well down to the exhaust pipe. The data and the technologies enable us to run this analysis. Now, at Kairos, we have a very dry <laughs> view of machine learning, very scientific, so we, do, we don't believe in esoteric terms like artificial intelligence, machine learning. So for us, machine learning is advanced statistics with computer science mixed. This is what we do. And what we do with that is that by gathering huge amounts of data, uh, we reconstruct a much better picture of the present which allow us also to run better predictions for the future. So this is the guiding principle. And the second thing is that we strongly believe that uh, we don't believe in technology being applied agnostically to the, tech, to the context. So you need to know the context to apply machine learning. So a lot of people are running uh, sort of unsupervised uh, black boxes algorithm whereby you just throw data into them and you try to make sense out of the output. Well, we believe that actually you need to know what you're looking for to make the most sense out of it, and you just let the algorithm optimize whatever you're looking for. So I'm going to illustrate a few examples of how we use these technologies and this data. And you need to understand that if you're not familiar with it, the energy sector, and especially the oil and gas, is very opaque. So a lot of the data on production, demand, and consumption is either not reported at all or reported like months, if not years late, at a very aggregated level, and it's often patchy and unreliable. So the first thing we can do is actually to track daily around 1.5 billion barrels of crude oil capacity and inventory. So that's extremely important because first of all, we have now by mixing different signals coming from satellites and other sources, we have an eye on the ground for many countries for which there was virtually no information. As you see, you can recognize some countries on the map. And we provide daily updates on that. This is extremely important because basically the way the global balances of the oil and gas market work are actually through the storage. So storage is really telling you to some extent, you know, how much is produced, how much is storage and demand. So really looking at the changes in storage can help uh, traders or everyone exposed to energy markets understand the supply and demand side across different products, but also across different geographies. So what's the impact of storage inventories going up in China compared to US consumption and so on and so forth. Here we want to illustrate a bit, uh, just to make you understand the, the opacity and, and the complexity of the sector. So what you see here, each bar are different countries. And what you see like the ones on, on your left are OPEC countries. And basically this is the average standard deviation of <coughs> monthly production. So you see that some areas in the world, they have standard deviation of 30%. So basically every month pr you have production swings of up to 30%. This is mostly due to unfortunate circumstances like uh, conflicts, war, or, or other events. But basically, there are huge swings, and these guys are producing millions and millions of barrels a day. On the other hand, you have different product producers, like the one here at the bottom, you see is the US. You have 4% actually swings in, uh, in, uh, in production on the standard deviation of production. But again, you have them participating in the energy market, it's a marginal barrel. Actually, little swings really change the price of the oil. And uh, the third characteristic that you see here is that some countries are data rich and some other are not so data rich, to put it in a way. So basically for the US, Canada, OECD producers, you can get a lot of data. So for us, it's really good because you can train your algorithm on these contexts, you make sure they work, and then you redeploy in countries where there was nothing available before. 
This is really cool, actually. <laughs> this is uh, another very important application, and that goes into the opacity, is that this allows us to actually reconstruct and find the missing barrels. So what are the missing barrels? So someone's laughing, so must know about it. <laughs> so the missing barrels are, uh, you know, the energy system or the oil and gas system, the way it works is that you have huge ports with import-export terminals, you have these storage tanks, and then you have boats coming in and out, the huge tankers. So boats can do two things. They can either offload oil, so you see the inventory rising, but they can also take oil out from the stocks, inventory goes down, and then they deliver it to someone else. Now, what happens is that oftentimes uh, these operations are either misrepresented or data is sort of lost, or some boats are actually turning off uh, their signals so that nobody knows what's going on, and that sends different signals to the market and competitors. So actually, for instance, we can mix different data here. So the blue line that you see are, are, are signals with which we track the inventory changes. And then the bars are other signals that we use to see what boats are reporting, so whether they are offloading or loading crude. Now, the interesting thing is that often you see a big discrepancy in between the two. So actually, when you have the discrepancies, most of the times what's happening is that someone is, not, is misrepresenting the, the situation or they're just shutting down the transponder so that you don't know what's going on. So again, that sheds new light into a very, very important part of the energy system. If we move now into, as we were saying, so the two previous examples, they, they are two uh, ways to build a much better view of the present world. And as we said, that enables us to build better predictions. So what you see here is actually how our algorithm, this is the curve of the lower 48, lower 48 are the, are the continental states in the US. And uh, the production, the monthly production is tracked and reported and forecasted by the Energy Information Agency of the US government, the EIA. So basically their, their forecast is sort of the benchmark for the sector. Uh, we saw, starting back in February, we saw the, the gray line is the reported up to date, and then you have the EIA projections and Kairos projections at the bottom. And what we saw in February is that algorithms, our algorithm was starting to see a much flatter production curve that did not correspond to the view of the market. So obviously it's a bit, uh, it's a contrarian view, and when you first see it, I mean, you, you need to double chain, you need to make sure, but actually it turned out that our, our view was actually quite accurate, and this is what has been happening. Again, this was because we were mixing information on financials, operators' behavior, uh, on subsurface, logistics, prices, etc. So again, it's a much more granular and better view of the context and is represented in the better forecast. But there is new also, uh, there are different other applications here, and, and here it's a bit of the narrative tension in between this new way of building analysis versus the traditional way. So what you see here, is, so these are the ending stock of US gasoline. Sorry if it's a bit technical, but this is a very important KPI for everybody trading oil or gasoline or derivatives in the US. And basically what it's telling you, every week you get reported what, were, what was the US consumption uh, of gasoline, and people trade on the next week forecast. So what we see here is like a number of analysts. These are people that have been running analysis for like 20 years or more, top analysts, uh, top names in, in Wall Street. And what you see is that our algorithm, this is actually sorted by mean average of the error. And what you see is that our algorithm are already much better than, than the ones that analytical uh, approaches or other analysis of people that have been in the business for 20 years or so. What that means is that we, we are refining more and more in these views. And in the very near future, you will see how the new market benchmarks are going to be driven by new ways of analysis rather than by the traditional ones. So that was a, a snapshot, and uh, this is what we're trying to do at Kairos. And we really believe that thanks to these um, new technologies and new alternative data available, markets in the energy sector and beyond are going to be drastically changed. So thanks. <laughs>